Welcome to the overview of the 10 building blocks of Chinuch. These building blocks, essentially, I call them 10 building blocks of Chinuch, they essentially cover all the areas that we need as Mechanchim, teachers, educators, uh, to cover for our children. It's not the actual curriculum per se, it's more like a framework. Number five, and I'm very excited, number five, I'm going to change the color here. Number five of the 10 building blocks is what I call the integrated curriculum. What's integrated curriculum mean? It means that every subject, geography, history, math, science, language, biology, astronomy, uh, anatomy, etc. Every what's otherwise known as a secular subject. Instead of teaching it as secular, don't teach it as secular at all because it isn't. Teach it as part of the Torah and I'll explain. Um, this is based on Rabbi Shimon Shuabatzal of Blessed Memory who told me himself that the word secular really means without God. Now, if you take the Rabbi Shlomo and take the Master of the Universe out of history, well, yeah, then history is secular, but that's not reality. That's not real. That's not, that's not a subject. How do, you, how do you take the author out of the book? Remove a Kodesh Baruch from science. Yeah, science is then secular. But guess what? That's ridiculous. That's not reality. Gravity is Hashem's hidden hand. Rainfall, sunshine, wind. All the different elements in creation are working in perfect harmony. And Hashem says, I want you to observe my perfect world. And when you read it, read the mathematical cal calculations of the exact distance between the sun and the earth. Look at and observe the literally 20 plus elements that have to coexist simultaneously for life to exist on planet earth and see the mathematical impossibility of this coming about without purpose, without a starting point. Hashem says, you know what? The purpose of studying my beautiful world is for you to see me in this world. And when you see me, I want you to not just see my invisible hand behind all the elements within creation. I also want you to see my hashkacha in history, my supervision of historical events based on a destiny which I have given you because I've given you promises, nevois, prophecies of what will happen, not what might happen, what will happen. Oh, so you, Hashem, have given us demarcation lines, which we're going to see in the contextual learning, but when we study history, we're going to study science, we're going to study math. What happens if we don't teach it as a secular subject, but rather teach it as, hey, this is Hashem's beautiful universe. Let's study it in order to see his kindness, and with it come to the greatest conclusion humanly possible. And what's the greatest human conclusion a human being can possibly come to? Well, what, what did Avraham Avinu come to? What was his conclusion? There's a Bayra Elam, okay, the Creator exists, and beyond that, what else? What, what do we know about the Creator? He's constantly good to us. Why? Because He loves us so much. Oh, interesting. The deepest, greatest, most penetrating, penetrating, most profound conclusion a human being can come to, besides the humility of realizing I know nothing, is to realize how much Hashem loves me, despite the fact that I'm just a little, little me. Really? Yeah. All of the universe, all of gravity, all sunshine, all of sunshine, all of the wind, all of the planets in perfect orbit of each other around the sun is all for a little old man. Bishvali nivraha ilam. I have an obligation to say every day, Akarash Baruch who created the entire universe just for me. Yes, just for me. Why? Because he loves us so much. Oh, so the purpose of science and history, the purpose of math as a language to read Hashem's perfect calculations within the perfect universe is to come to the conclusion that Akarash Baruch Hu is so good, so kind, so loving all the time. And in return, not only will we have a year of Hashem, which is what Rambam claims is a mitzvah of Es Hashem el Tira, to have a, a profound awe of Hashem's existence in our lives. I'm using the word awe as opposed to fear, even though there is an element of Yiras HaOinesh, but Yiras HaShamayim really refers to seeing the, the heavens, the clouds. Shamayim, Shamayim, the water's over there. How did it get there? Oh, the sun, gravity. 
and evaporation from the oceans. And you start to realize, oh, Hashem, you're the hidden hand behind all of this. So of course there's an aspect of Yiras Hashem where you do want to translate it as fear. It's more fear out of getting out of relationship with the Kaddish Baruch that we should fear the most. But yes, there is a concept of Yiras Chet, Yiras Ha'oinesh, we're in fear of the consequences of negative thinking, of negative speaking, Lashon Hara, of neg negative actions, of Hashem behaving like Russia. Uh, yeah, we should be in fear of that. But the, the essential purpose of Yiras Hashem is Yiras HaRoimimus, is to come to a realization that Hashem is so profoundly in love with us that we are in fear of losing that relationship. That's the only fear we should ever have. And that's ultimately Yirat Shemaim. The word Shemaim is such an interesting word. It is, it, most of the time, our sages don't use the term Yiras Hashem. We use the word Yirat Shemaim. Now, that's, that's not abstract. That's very concrete. Because Shemaim is Shamayim, over there is water. How to get there? Oh, evaporation from the oceans. How did that happen? Oh, the heat from the sun, 93 million miles away. Oh, really? And that's because of the perfect gravitational ratio between the sun and the earth that the water is able to rise. Oh, and then as it does, it cools because the atmosphere gets cool as it goes further up until it condenses, comes back down as rain. Oh, so you're at Shamayim, Shamayim, Samayim, it rises because of the gravity, and it's made up of Asian Mayim, the heat from the sun, the waters from the ocean, Shamayim, oh, Yira Shamayim really means, look at the heavens, look at the clouds there everywhere, and remind myself, me, bara, Eila, who created all this? Oh, Hashem's hidden hand. Oh, so the purpose of the integrated curriculum is to teach what would otherwise be called secular subjects completely from a Torah perspective. How do you do that? We're going to go into details, but to give you a quick answer, it's very simple. How do we do that? Take the six days of creation and the rest of the Chumash, but start with the six days because the Chumash is the curriculum. And as you travel through the six days and eventually the rest of the Chumash, you will find everything is there. Yeah, hafuchba, hafuchba. Yeah, it's true. But let me show you how obvious it is. First day of creation, light. Oh, Gravity, let's start learning about light. Second day of creation, water is split. Oh, let's learn about watersheds and water cycles. Let's learn about the water rising off the oceans into the clouds, rakia. Oh, and now you've got water above and water below. Oh, so we're going to learn all about the workings of water on the second day. Third day, land forms, oceans. And then the land appears. Oh my gosh, we're going to learn about mountains and valleys, oceans, rivers, three parts of a river, how the rivers flow into the seas, into the oceans. Oh, fourth day astronomy, moon, stars, sun. Oh, we, can learn, we learn all about the universe. Fifth day, oh, we're going to learn about the birds. Oh, the fish. Sixth day, animals, man. Let's learn anatomy. Let's learn ashayatsa bi'iyun based on the sixth day. Oh, you can take anything you want out of the six days of creation. Shabbos, Lamates Malachas, oh my gosh, seventh day. You've got all types of creative work. So we can study wool, study the making of bread, study grain, study agriculture. You see, in the six days plus Shabbos, you basically have the starting point, the platform for every secular subject, every part of general studies. Uh, you start going through the Chumash even as early as the first few prokim of Bereshis, you already have tools with uh, kain and tuval kain and music. You already have the generations. Now you have genealogy in chapter 5, 10 and 11 of Adam till Neach, Neach till Avram, 20 generations. Oh my gosh, you've got genealogy there. You want to learn about rock forms, take that from the third day. Oh yeah, we'll learn about uh, volcanoes, take that from the third day. Learn about thunder and lightning. Oh, that's going to be from the second day because that's the workings of water, electricity. Oh my gosh, you, you see, you've got everything in the Torah. It really is there. So we'll use the Torah as the starting point. Later on, you can specialize in specific subjects. But initially, guess what? Everything comes from the Torah. We know that already. Oh, so let's teach secular subjects initially as an integrated curriculum. Now, I'll give you examples later on where it becomes much more concrete and it'll be... Uh, I'm, I'm here to claim it's more of a switch in the mind as opposed to changing the curriculum. I'm not offer, offering a whole different curriculum. This is a framework. A framework means it's a different way of framing the information. And so it becomes always the same message. Hashem, you're real. You're in my life. 
you love me. And everything I do, everything I say, everything I think is part of my Bechira, my free will that you gifted me, literally, to demonstrate my love for you, my awe for you, my interaction with other people. Everything ultimately in these 10, we haven't finished them yet, but so far the five of the 10 building blocks is not about a new curriculum. It's all about a framework with a switch of the mind more than anything else to realize, oh my gosh, we're we're learning Tarek Mitzvahs in Chumash anyway, but we just don't look at it as Tarek Mitzvahs. Oh, we're learning the storyline anyway, but we don't look at it as a storyline and break it down so that we can understand the beginning, middle, and end and teach it, as you're going to see, with pictures, with lots of materials so that the children can learn in their strength, Darkai, in his or her way, oh, so that the children will be more likely to understand it and enjoy it, love it, be endeared, and want more and let their natural curiosity continually grow. So over here, what we want to stop is the concept of Kaidish and Chal. Because dangerously, what ends up happening with, well, we're learning Kaidish now, now we're learning Chal. Chal is becoming Treif, Kaidish is Kaidish, Chal is Treif. But in the mind of a child, open, okay, children, close your Chumash, open up your math book. Close your math, open up your Nach. Close your Nach, open up your geography book. Close your geography, open up your science book. In the mind of the child, Torah and science have nothing to do with each other. Math and Chumash, nothing to do with each other. Nothing? One second. Perak Aleph, Yoim Echad. Echad, oh, that's one. Oh, so that means I have to understand the qualitative and quantitative value of one. Yoim Sheni, oh, we're into fractions. Shlishi, second day, third day, fourth day. So division of six days, which is really part of seven days of the week. Oh, so the whole is the seven days and Shabbos is the starting and the end of the cycle, the start, end, the title, start, end the cycle. Oh, so it's all rotating around Shabbos and everything else is a fraction of what Shabbos is, which is a real day. Oh my gosh. The, there's math throughout the Chumash. Ten generations from Adam till Noach. Adam lived 930 years. Noach 950. Lamech 777. Mr. Shelach 969. Oh, um... Hanach, 365, whoa. And the Chumash goes out of its way in Perak He and then later Perak Yud Aleph to tell me who lived, how long, when they began, began having children, what were the names of the children, how long each one lived. You got math all over the place. Length of the Teva, width of the Teva, height of the Teva. Oh, how long was the marble? 40 days, 40 nights. Oh, 150 days before the water receded. And you got dates. You got a quantification of of how many people and pairs, or how many kosher pairs, how many kosher birds. You have so many numbers flying all over the place. The Torah assumes you understand the relative quantity of one number in its relationship to another number. You, get, you come to uh, uh, Parshish Truma, and you've got all the dimensions of the, of the Aaron HaKadosh, of the Shulchan, of the Menorah, of the Mishkan. You've got, salt, you've got math all over the place. Yes, you have rivers, Pishain, Hidekel, Gichain, Fras. You've got four rivers in Perak base. Where are they? Oh, Mesopotamia. Where's Mesopotamia? Oh, Pishain is the river Nile. Oh, where is it? Oh, here's the Nile Delta. Bring it alive. The Torah is describing physical places. You've got geography inside the Torah. The Torah is assuming I understand what is a Har, what is a Nahal. What is, what is the Yarden? These are places which we can familiarize ourselves, even if we don't live in Eretz Yisrael yet. We still have photographs, satellite photos of these places, bring it alive. Because geography is not a separate subject. It's inside the Chumash. There are places of ancient, in Perak Yud of the, of the Chumash, you've got Nineveh. Nineveh's still on the map. Oh my gosh. You've got Nebuchadnezzar's palace, which is in ruins. Yeah, it's still there. These are places that, are, that, that Nach mentions and that are mentioned throughout Chumash. Mars Machpelah, Keva Rachel. These are places that are still part. Oh, so geography is not a secular subject. There are ways to teach this when you realize the Chumash is the curriculum. And it's screaming out, over here's geography, over here's math. Over here's geometry with the Mishkan. I forget to Mishnayis with Kalim. Oh, yeah, you've, you've got almost every subject throughout the Chumash and Nach. And if you add on Mishnayis, of course we have. Uh, you want to learn about government? Fine. 
Well, where's American government in the Chumash? Whoa, 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 look at the context. Where do you first see a despot, a dictator? Oh, Nimrod. Well, that's one form of government. What else? Oh, you, you see four kings against five kings in chapter 14 in Parshas Lechacha. Oh, so you've got kingdoms? How does that work? Oh, later on, the Torah in Tariag Mitzvahs gives us a mitzvah of a melech. And it tells us um, he has to come from the Jewish people. Oh, he has to write a safer Torah for himself. What else? Oh, how many wives is allowed up to? And uh, how much money? Uh, how many horses? Oh, what rights does he have? Where is he going over? And where is he, his, his own authority that can actually override halacha? Oh, so in other words, we already have a structure where in Chumash and Nach, there are descriptions of dictators. And then there's a description of how a Torah autonomy works with the Supreme Court of the Sanhedrin, the Kain Gadol. You've got the Gadol Adar, or known as the Nasi, and the Skan, uh, the deputy. Oh, you have a whole system of courts with three, 23, 71. Oh, so study Torah government. And when you do and understand how Hilchas Sanhedrin and Hilchas Edim and Hilchas, Hilchas Dayanim, how the laws pertain to protecting civilians, especially those who are the most conducive for being taken advantage of, an Almana, a Yasaima, a Dal, a poor person, poor in mind or poor in mitzvahs, even a Russia. I'm not allowed to judge him because he's a Russia. No, I've got to judge him based on the evidence that's available to me. Oh, so there are Torah laws, Pashas Mishpatim, Kadoshim, all over the place in Tariq Mitzvahs that help me understand what is Torah government. Now you want to study American government? You want to st study communism and, and uh, socialism and democracy? Because it's hate. But guess what? You've created the children a context of what's our opinion? Excuse me. What's the Rebbe Shalom's opinion about how man should govern man? And now look at democracy and help the kids see, well, why didn't Kaddish Baruch Hu choose democracy? What's one possible downside? Freedom of speech. Freedom of speech. Well, we actually have 31 mitzvahs in the Torah that pertain to how to speak, how to control our mouths. Oh, interesting. You see, we have halachas. We have directives that govern how I should think, speak, act. And it's within that that I have an accountability. And democracy could go way too far where it permits what the Torah forbids because it's popular. Or right now it's in mode, it's in vogue, it's in fashion, and I'm a nerd or I'm politically incorrect if I follow the Torah's version of defining marriage. Oh, yeah, if we don't follow the Torah and look at what does the Torah have to say, why should we be opening ourselves up to other isms before we've first taught our children what does the Torah have to say about government? So what I'm basically bringing out is everything is in the Torah. You want to learn about metals, learn about coins? Hey, Terach was one of the first people to ever mint a coin, according to Sefer Yasha. Avram Avinu minted coins in his time. Oh, so we can, we can take the backdrop of Chumash and Nach, Mishnayis and certainly Shas, as our starting point for any of these subjects.